up. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming. This is the second in our Southwest Marine Ecosystems webinar series. Um, we are running a whole host of webinars. I've put um, the rest of the program in the chat. Uh, these are run by um, not just University of Exeter, but our partner organizations at um, Plymouth Marine Lab, uh, Plymouth University and the MBA as well. Um, so do check those out. Um, as I said, all these webinars will be recorded, um, including this one. So don't worry if you run into internet trouble um, and have to drop out um, or can't make one of the other sessions, they'll all be uploaded to the Southwest Marine Ecosystems YouTube channel. Um, so we've got some fantastic speakers tonight. Um, we'll be uh, having four uh, talks, um, each lasting about half an hour. Um, we'll run a break um, in between. Um, around halfway and there'll be time after each talk hopefully for questions um, as I say you can pop these in the chat um, or if you want to ask them in person you can pop your hand up and we will unmute you. Um, I think that's everything uh, so we'll get cracking and I'll welcome our first speaker tonight um, Duncan Jones who is skipper and researcher for Marine Discovery Penzance um, and he'll be talking to us about the 2022 summary of Southwest Cetacean Sightings. Over to you, Duncan. Oh, thank you. Um, right, I'm just gonna get organized. Is, can everyone see that? Yeah, is that all good? Yeah, excellent. Right. Okay. So yeah. Um, so yeah. Thanks for the introduction. So yeah, I'm gonna just be talking about an overview of station observations in uh, southwest waters in 2022. Um, right. Um, so. Most of the um, data I'm talking about is uh, comes from three main sources. So first of all, we've got the Sequest Southwest um, data set, which is the what the Cornwall Wildlife Trust collect through and comes through Orcs and Ercus. Um, and that's the gray dots on this map. And mostly covers the coast of Cornwall, but also include, includes boat operator data from us from Marine Discovery Penzance, from AK Cruises, from Padstow Sea Life Safaris, um, Atlantic uh, sea, um, Nuki Sea Safaris and Fishing and various others. So it has quite a comprehensive coverage of the Cornwall coastline. The orange dots are show you data from Orca organization Cetacea. So they um, have kindly provided their data set, which is really useful because it covers offshore the offshore area. And if you if you consider looking at just the Sequest Southwest data set, we're kind of very blinkered in looking just close to the coast. So it's nice to have offshore data. And their data is collected on board ships and ferries. They have um, observers on board and also people on board who, who talk and guide the guests and encourage guests to record information through the through their Orca app as well. But they also it also includes sightings from the coastline. So Orca observers can access the app and, and can um, do land-based watches or watches from boats as well. There might be some duplicates between the Sequest Southwest and the Orca data set, because I know um, some of our Cornish observers who su will possibly submit to both, both sets. And then I've got a few sightings from, from the Dorset Wildlife Trust. Um, in some of my totals, there are there is information from other counties, so some from Somerset and, um, and so on, but not, not for this year, unfortunately. So we're still struggling to get data beyond um, Cornwall, but it's great to have the Orca data in there. Um, so I'm just going to go through species by species, and I'm going to look at how this year's sightings or observations compare to previous years, look at some of the seasonality of it. Um, but then I did a couple of other things where I'm uh, using models to try and um, see if I can um, see how valid our data is, if you like, so how, how well it's performing. Um, um, and if it's giving us good, clear information. Um, I'll talk at the end about how we are going to try and improve uh, or would like to improve our, our data collection. Um, but anyway, I'll get on move on because I've got quite a lot of slides. So with harbour porpoises, we can see that in 2021 and 2022, we had an increase in sightings. But what we have to remember here is, is we've only had the orca data since 2021. So that adds to our sightings. Um, also, 2020 was a pandemic year, so there was a lot, certainly a lot less boat-based survey effort, although still there were more sightings then than 2019. 
Also, the other thing to consider since 2020, um, I feel we need to check this, but I feel like our survey effort, the amount of people out looking and the amount of data we're getting has increased. Certainly from a boat operator perspective, we've seen a lot of the Cornish companies increase the number of boats they've got and increase the hours on the water. And, and so that's something when we're trying to look at data and compare year on year, we need to think about, about that. And one of the things we need to do is to try and establish for this report a, um, a, a um, sources of where our data is coming from, consistent sources that we use year on year. So slightly less pauper sightings in 2022 than 2021. Um, weather can really affect detectability of porpoises. And we're not really including um, information about weather in, in, this, uh, in this data. So we know, for example, at the end of 2022, October, November, um, and November, December, really stormy. So that's potentially going to affect sighting rates. Um, we tend to have a lot of seasonality in the sightings of porpoises from around the Cornish coast. They're here year round. And even in the months where we see less, there still appear to be a, a high sightings rate. I certainly know in Mounts Bay, very high sightings rate per amount of effort searching, um, comparable with anywhere in the UK. But we do see this big peak, this big influx in July, August and September. And interestingly, where I've done a lot of work with my data from Mounts Bay, I have the same pattern. But I assumed that when we had low sighting rates, other areas of Cornwall would have higher sighting rates. But according to this data, they don't. So where do the porpoises go is an interesting question. And I think in a minute I can show a slide that might explain that. Um, but it's, it's really interesting to see the seasonality in this movement inshore. And when in July, August and September, when, when sighting rates really go up, it, Cornwall is a very important place then for, for harbour purposes. Or a certain, sorry, the southwest coastal waters are a very important place for harbour purposes. Um, so what I did with each of the different species is I actually did a little bit of modelling just to see what we could see, see what we could learn from the data and to try and use this to validate the data set against another survey. So um, you may have heard of the SCANS surveys. So the SCANS, Small Stations of the Atlantic and North Sea, are surveys conducted um, through St Andrews University um, roughly every 10 years. They do, a, um, they do aerial and ship-based surveys and, um, and try and get an idea of population sizes of, dif of different cetacean species in around well, in the Northeast Atlantic and, and the um, North Sea. Um, so I'm going to come on to that in a minute, but this, what this shows, the black dots show, the black circles show where there's an observation. And then the red, the red of the color in the background is um, the more light or the, the, sorry, the greater probability you are of detecting a porpoise in relation to other areas within this, within the map. So it's a relative, predicted probability of presence. Um, because all our data is very inshore, I think our, our sighting, or sorry, the prediction is quite inshore bias. Although I did include a, what we call a prior or a bias file to, to try and account for some of the bias in it. Interestingly, if we compare it to the scans data, so these dots show the scans surface density. So their prediction of, of where porpoises would be, it's not so far off the mark. And the other thing that you have to consider with the scans data is it's very temporally biased because they do the survey at the end of June and the start of July. And if you remember back here, that's right between here where, where we actually are coming off our lowest sightings rate. And what they're seeing is more porpoises further offshore, potentially. Um, we don't have enough data to ratify, you know, to, 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 to say whether our model would predict out here but I wonder if what's happening is that the porpoises are up in in this area here where we have no data from when it's when it's when there's less animals around the coastline and then as we go into the summer we get this inshore sip, shift into the area that the model predicts we might find more porpoises certainly an interesting question to try and answer um, and the area up here is is one of the um, special conservation porpoises and it's the, the data for selecting that is highly biased by the scans data. But what 
is never seems to be considered with the scans data is that it's very much a snapshot of one time frame of what's going on. And actually these animals move around and there is this seasonality in their movement. So anyway, so it suggests that our information for harbour porpoises is quite useful. Um, where we're detecting around um, three and a half thousand porpoises, we're probably accounting for about 5% of the population in the Western approaches with that. Um, so just moving on from that to bottomnose dolphins. Um, so 2022 seemed to be quite a good year for bottomnose dolphin sightings. Again, in 2022, with the ORCA data, we've got their full data set. In 2021, their data, the, the amount of effort, the, the amount of time they were on ships was reduced because the, the cruise industry was still recovering from COVID. 2022 showed a real, sorry, 2020 showed a real dip. Um, but quite often, a lot of our bottomized dolphin sightings, certainly from the tour boats, are uh, in the early season and the late season. And in 2020, our uh, season ran from July to the end of October, and, and that was it because of COVID. So it's likely that COVID could have had a, an influence. It might not have done. Um, but certainly, we've seen this increase in 2022. One of the things that we are noticing is that we're more, we seem to more consistently be picking up these larger offshore pods of bottomized dolphins. And that could account for the increase in sightings. Um, having said, we see most of ours in the early season, late season, a lot of the sightings here are in um, August, September and in the midsummer, but equally a lot of these are probably from the from um, offshore from the ships uh, where orca are surveying. Um, so again, I, I ran, the, ran the model here and unsurprisingly, because a lot of our data comes from close to the coast, it and key habitat close to the coast. What we know about this, and certainly from the study I forgot who did it with the, um, the bottom, inshore bottomnose dolphin pod, this model is predicting similar habitat um, suitability to, to their model and similar likelihood of occurrence to their model predicted. Um, if we compare it to the scans data, so their data suggests that we should be seeing or get a lot more bottomnose dolphins further offshore, but their data is probably or potentially very much biased by these large offshore pods and it's actually hiding the inshore ecotypes that that um we're seeing more close to the coast so actually demonstrates possibly that the the data from southwest marine ecosystems is quite important in that it highlights this um more vulnerable population that's in closer contact with with um human activities that anthrop anthropogenic impacts along the coastline that's actually lost in the scans data because of the larger sizes and the greater abundance of bottomnose dolphins offshore. Because we know, or we're fairly confident, the two ecotypes don't, don't mix. And so having these data sets um, and having, having this information and being able to, to um, report on it is actually quite important. And it shows the value again of the Southwest, uh, the South Coast Bottomnose Dolphin Consortium in highlighting the importance of the, the coast um, for the inshore pod as well. So um, again, quite easy, interesting to, to consider. We had one solitary um, bottomnose dolphin in 2022 named John. I don't know if we ever did get a, an ID, a sex on whether it was male or female. Um, but anyway, so John was recorded um, consistently between mid-April and mid-August. Although uh, in January, Ian Borum did record a solitary dolphin off, or a, a lone bottomnose dolphin off Land's End. So that could have been, he could have been around since, since January. Um, and then in mid-August seemed to disappear and we haven't really heard much from him. Although possibly there's been a lone bottomnose dolphin around the North Coast, around the Nuki area um, in the last few, last month or so. So his range, he was seen from between Foy and Padstow, um, spent quite a lot of time in the St. Ives Bay area and around Penzance. Um, and, is, is, is this a solitary dolphin to be concerned about or not? Well, time will tell with that. Um, if you read the literature, bottomnose dolphins spend a lot more time on their own than we would think. So quite often we think, oh, a solitary dolphin has lost its pod or, or been ostracized from the pod and, and it's at risk. Um, but John, when certainly when I've encountered him from what I've heard from other people, um, he behaves around boats like the inshore pod animals do. And at, hasn't shown any of the extreme social behavior where he's interacting with swimmers and so on. Um, so possibly um, John 
was just having some alone time and now he's um, um, relocated with a pod. We, we don't really know. We'll have to see, see what happens with that one. Um, so on to common dolphins. Sorry, I'm speeding through this. And um, common dolphins are uh, by far the most recorded animal uh, in the in um, in 2022, and um, there were kind of numbering sightings over 25,000. Um, and last year we had 27,500. So really high 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 numbers of records. And again, since in the last couple of year, years, it seems to have really um, exploded. And some of that is explained again by the inclusion of the orca data. But actually, even in the sequest data, which we consistently had. The number of common dolphin sightings has gone up a lot. Um, we don't know why that is. It might link to, um, you know, we're seeing tuna more consistently, uh, higher numbers of minke whales, higher numbers of humpbacks. So it's possible that we've got this increase of in um, in prey, you know, what they want to feed on in our waters, certainly in the late summer, because again, there's a seasonality to the site or appears to be a seasonality to the site also going to be a seasonality to the searching effort as well so we need to to think about that um but it's possible that you know there's different theories but we we could be it could be that where once we were more towards the northern end of their range with a, a shift north of common dolphins we're now more in within the center of their range it might be that we're going through a period where we're seeing more of the the fish they want to feed on closer inshore and that's why we're seeing them closer inshore. You know, the, the pilchard uh, or the ring net fleets are exploding in size at the moment because there's a lot of fish for them to go out and catch. That could be, a, a, you know, that maybe that'll increase year on year and, and, and build. Or maybe we're in some kind of decadal or, or multi-decadal cycle where we're at a peak of common dolphin sightings and then it will drop off. We, it, it's hard to know. But at the moment, we're seeing uh, high, very high numbers of sightings. And again, if we run the, the model for these guys, it predicts really quite a high rate of sightings across the whole area. And, and that's what we're seeing you know, we, on, the, on the boats when we go out now. From, from July to the end of the season, we're seeing dolphins, common dolphins every time we go out, multiple pods of common dolphins every time we go out. And, and they're around, they've been around in big numbers this winter. Um, so at the moment, it's a you know, real a strong abundance of common dolphins in southwest waters the data kind of agrees with the scans data interestingly the scans data um is from 2005 and 2016 that i'm using or that they used to create these surfaces so 2016 was really just when this big increase in common dolphin sightings was starting to happen and their model predicts a lot more dolphins um further offshore and in the the western part of the channel and then as you go further up the channel, um, a lot less. But what I think we're starting to see now, although we don't have the data, I don't have the data to back it up. This is just um, from what I see from people talking in posts. So we're getting common dolphins much further up the channel, much more consistently. Um, so interesting to, to follow and see what happens in, in the following years with common dolphins. So dolphins, lovely, lovely looking species. Um, this was an amazing encounter we had this summer when we had some bow riding. Um, which is lovely to see. Um, so Rizzo's, um, sightings rates for Rizzo's tend to fluctuate year on year. Um, so cephalopod feeders, and um, certainly in Mounts Bay when they're around, we know they're feeding on cuttlefish. And cuttlefish recruitment is really temperature dependent. So the numbers of cuttlefish can really depend on the previous year's weather conditions. Also in stormier years, it tends to be a, a lower recruitment and so on. So the numbers of, of um, cuttlefish available for Rizzo's to feed on can fluctuate greatly. And, and we think that is why we have these big fluctuations. So we'll have a year where we see a lot of animals and a year when we don't see so many. We also have photo uh, identification matches between, certainly between the Cornish coast and um, Barty Island, the Cornish coast and the Isle of Man. And we know that they have photo matches from the Isle of Man and, um, to, up to the west coast of Scotland. So potentially these animals are ranging over a long distance and they're always going to be in a place where they um, where there's an abundance of food, you know, where they can forage more successfully. So they they move potentially move around quite a lot. How and what triggers a, a large scale movement and whether they move to an area and stay there for a period of time. I guess if you've had a good recruitment year for cuttlefish, then following years are going to be good because you've got a good stop to start with. 
Um, we also don't understand yet if they feed on, on squid further offshore and if there's a relationship there. And so um, there's an a lot to, to look into with RISOs. Scans don't have any information, uh, any data for RISOs, so they, they, don't, um, they don't have a predicted surface model for RISOs. Uh, typically, again, sightings peak around May and June, and that's when cuttlefish are coming in short of spawn. Cuttlefish spawning is very temperature dependent, and at some point in June, the temperature, water temperature will hit the right moment, and that's when they'll come in short of spawn. And the RISOs seem to follow. Um, and then we seem to get this late peak in the end of summer as well. Which interestingly is if, if we see pilot whales during that late peak is when we'll see them. Um, <clears throat> the model again is very coastally biased, like when we're seeing those, we're seeing them very close inshore, but we do know that they occur further offshore and we can see that from these sightings from the orca data. And we don't really have enough data for further offshore to, to know if this is, is a good predictive model of, of RISOs. Um, but we certainly know that sightings there's a correlation between risso sightings and eelgrass um, because eelgrass is good cuttlefish spawning habitat. And it's one of the, when we run models with risso stage, it's one of the most predictive um, environmental layers to, to include in the model. So we're trying to learn a bit more about risos and uh, trying to understand more. Killer whales haven't had any sightings this year. Last year we had this is sorry this photo is the the one from uh, taken from the Minac of uh, when John Kerr and Aquarius passed by. And that was in 2021, and we had five orca sightings in 2021. Uh, two lots of two, which were Jonko and Aquarius on the same day, I think, and then this uh, a single other sighting. Um, but yeah, so not too much to say about orcas. They definitely passed by. Will we start to see more with more tuna and things around that they might like to feed on? Who knows? We'll see. Um, striped dolphins, again, similar to orcas, we're really right at the northern extent of their range. and. Um, the 2022 sightings, you know, the records for them come from 48 degrees south, which is really pushing the boundaries of what we might consider the southwest. Um, and again, come from, from on ship with Orca. They, those were in the late season in October. And then there was a single sighting from March, which was, um, which was up off the north coast as well. So we do get them turning up here, um, but we're really on the edge to out of their range, really. So maybe we'll start to see more with, with warming oceans, we'll see. Um, white beak dolphins, so we know about the, the white beak dolphin population from Lime Bay, although they do seem to move in and out of the western approaches, um, and we know that, that it's a long way south for them. This photo was actually taken in Iceland, I didn't have a white beak dolphin photo that I could use, and I didn't have time to mission, so I used one from when I took my students to Iceland. Um, but yeah, so so the white beaks when they we there was a good year of sightings in 2021, and then less in 2022. But with so few of them around, it, the the sightings rates can probably jump up and down. All it would take is a couple of you know three or four people to see and report a reasonable sized pod of them, and suddenly you've got like 50 animals reported. Um, so again, we have got this population down here. We are a long way south for them. And it is interesting that they're here. We need to try and better understand what's going on there. Pilot whales, we had um, certainly you know, only a few seen this year, certainly compared to 2020, when we had seemed to have a fairly large pods of them being sighted in a few places around the Cornish coast. Typically, if we see pilot whales, it's in the late summer. We know that in the past, there have been years when Pilot whales have occurred fairly regularly. They, you know, there were photo identification catalogues for them um, from along the south coast. Um, and that time seems to have passed. So are we, you know, maybe again there's a, a decadal fluctuation in pilot whale sightings, and it depends on, on squid in the late summer and, and, and species of squid and, and how close to the coast they're located. Um, something to watch, but I think like the Rizzos, potentially their their presence could could fluctuate quite wildly. Um, so unidentified dolphins, obviously these are easy to identify, these are um, common dolphins when you're this close and you're looking down on a calm day, it's easy. But it's also very easy just to have a glimpse of an animal and not be able to identify it properly. And um, it's interesting, ten, when you get the unidentified records, they tend to come from two sides. They either come from people who are very inexperienced and don't really know what dolphins they're looking at, or they come from very experienced observers who are confident enough to say they didn't know what they saw. 
quite often in the middle, you get people who think they need to tell you what it was. Um, but sometimes it's good to have the confidence to say, um, I don't know what that was. We seem to have a, an increase in 2022, possibly because we've got um, more people out there looking, more new people. Um, maybe we've got some more experienced observers who are, are not worried about saying they didn't know what species it was. But um, it's good to have the unidentified ones in there because it gives you confidence in the data. Um, OK, so on to whales. Dan's going to talk about humpback whales, so I won't spend too long talking about them. This is a photo actually from 2018 in, in August. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so this year so far, we have had, sorry, I'm just moving, so I can't really see my figures properly. Hang on. There we go. Um, we've had less sightings than in 2021. It's been still been a good year. Um, we didn't have so many in January and February as, as um, in 2021, so that's why the, the numbers have dropped. But the sea conditions were maybe not so good for, for spotting them then. Um, it's really interesting the increase we've had in humpbacks after the la over the last few years, and, and it's been the same around the southwest of, of Ireland, where they've been seeing a lot more even through the summer. Typically, our humpback sightings are in the winter months. This year, we had one in April, um, and we have seen them in August. In the previous year, they seem to be around further offshore in July and August. Um, a lot of our sightings come from out around the Isles of Scilly. Um, we do get a lot of sightings from close inshore around the coastline. And we know that humpbacks, that habitat for humpbacks can be in, in shallow waters, but we also know that they can be or, or survive quite successfully in deep water. They make huge migrations and, and they can be seen feeding um, along the shelf edge as well. Um, so when typically when we're seeing them in the winter, a lot of our observers are on the shore and there's less offshore effort anyway. Um, so that's going to bias our, our data inshore. But it is really interesting that we're consistently getting these years where humpbacks are coming very close inshore to forage in the winter months. Great for viewing, um, but it also shows us that there's an abundance of something they want to feed in. And they're, they're really close in, you know, right in on the inshore tide fronts, sometimes metres off the cliffs where the water's deep next to the coast. Um, and um, again, the Isles of Scilly seem to provide good, good habitat for, for humpbacks. So something to watch, and, and Dan's going to talk a lot about the humpbacks. There's no data for humpbacks from scans, and actually that's possibly because their surveys, certainly the surveys we've got now running up to 2016, but also they're in June and July when we're not really seeing so many around this area. <coughs> um, fin whales. So fin whales, um, we're, again, 2022 was a pretty good year for fin whale sightings. Again, lots of the sightings were out around the Isles of Scilly. Um, typically, fin whales are much further offshore, and there seems to be a greater abundance of them along the shelf edge feeding. And um, when we do get them around, it's often at the peak of when we're seeing lots of common dolphins, lots of minke whales, and potentially there's a lot of food around. Um, can be seen throughout the year, so they do seem to come closer inshore in the winter when the humpbacks are around, but we, we do get them um, in, in most months of the year, or certainly record them in most months of the year. For a big animal, they can be incredibly tricky to watch from a boat because they're, you know, they're really fast and um, they sometimes might have kilometers between their surfaces. Um, so it can be quite tricky to watch. Um, this increase in 2021 and 2022 is possibly because we've got, uh, again, the orca data in there, so we're getting a lot more data from further offshore. Although well, having said that, there's a lot of sightings um, from closer inshore in the Seacrest data as well. So the modeling that I did for these, um, we really don't have that many sightings, but it kind of agrees with what the scans data shows in that the, the, you know, the, you're more likely to see fin whales out towards the continental shelf edge, but then there are certain things and certain conditions that can bring them closer inshore. Um, so minke whales, we've had, again, like common dolphins, we've had this explosion in sightings. Um, in the last couple of years, I've seen more minke whales that, uh, year on year than I, than I ever have. And um, it suggests that, well, if you think more, there are more out there. And it, again, it coincides with this increase in common dolphin sightings, coincides with this uh, increase in tuna sightings. So they're coming here to take advantage of um, of you know the, the pilchards and the mackerel and um, 
the, the, the sprats that we're seeing close in shore that the ring netters are going after. And something has triggered that, something has caused an increase. Um, if the numbers start to drop off again, it, again, it might be that we're, we're in some kind of cycle, positive, negative cycle with, with sightings, but it, it might be might be something else. It's interesting to watch. There's, again, the seasonality to the sightings, and we tend to think late summer is a good time to see them, although April and May, there were, there were good sightings as well. And um, if we predict habitat, it's quite similar to the harbour porpoise habitat. Again, we probably need more data for further offshore. Um, but there does seem to be um, some really important sites around the Cornish coast for minke whale foraging in the summer months, which is really exciting and really interesting something to watch and to monitor. And actually, again, the data doesn't disagree with, with what the what scans are finding, although, again, we haven't got that much offshore effort. So it kind of the, looking at it with the scans data over the top really does validate that although there's a lot of effort bias in our data, and although we're not counting for it, it shows that that there's value in the data set and that, and that um, with careful use and careful understanding of it, it can it can show us trends in, in what's going on. Um, say whales. This is actually not a say whale, although it's a pretty tricky one. And rorqual whales can be really difficult to identify unless you get very good um, shots. We thought this was a say whale when we were watching it because of its behavior. Um, but then we did get a photo where we could see the white bands, the white minky mittens. So we decided in the end that, that it probably was a minky. And um, well, it was a minky. Um, and that actually in 2022, we haven't got a record for say well. In the last three years, we've had one record in, in each of the years. And um, they do seem to turn up occasionally, although it's it's very difficult to to sometimes to identify raw calls you know from a distance if you've got a very obvious fin whale very obvious say whale very obvious minky whale it's easy but when you don't have a very obvious one it can be it can be quite tricky and unless you get information on the i you know if you, you can see the actual identification features like the white bands or the asymmetric draw of the fin whale white bands on the minky whale flippers um the say whale rostrum and so on it, it can be very tricky um and that brings me on to unidentified whales. This is actually the previous whale uh, lunging. And um, we had, again, a big increase in unidentified whales sighted, probably again, because we've got the orca data from further offshore. And think on a big ship, if you're seeing whales at a distance, you know, it can be very hard to be definite or to be sure of what you're looking at. Um, so another thing that that is quite exciting and that we're we're getting online is is the the F pods. So what the F pods are is they're pods that um, have been provided by um, Shalonia to different marine groups around the southwest to deploy, and they detect say, um, cetacean uh, vocalizations. So they detect clicks, and ultimately with the F pods, what we're hoping or what is hoped that we can identify between species. Uh, at the moment, they consistently can tell between porpoises and dolphins, um, but it can be tricky. Um, but we're hoping that they'll be able to to um, to differentiate between species. This is F pod data um, from the coronation wreck, which is between Penny Point and Rain Head, and it's deployed um, for Wembry Marine Group with the help of Keith Fiskock and some of his friends. Uh, and the data was analysed by Freya Diamond from the University of Plymouth, and they've kindly provided it. So so. Um, we can start to include it. But we have hopefully got some FPOD data from lots of different sites around the southwest coastline that we're going to be able to include in the report. And it's it's a new dimension to, to sightings coming in because the FPOD's out there sitting, listening all the time. And it'd be really interesting to look at looking at this um, these dates here to know what was going on on the 8th of October and see if any we can see what's going on with any environmental conditions which led to that peak. Or was it just a, a pod of common dolphins passing through? Um, but yeah, so interesting data for the future. Um, where do we go in the future? I guess I think what we need to do, you know, if we want to compare year on year and use this as almost like an early warning mechanism that something is changing, we need to find consistent, reliable data sources that we're using every year. Um, and um, because if we've been going for X amount of years and then we bring in another big data set, it suddenly skews the data. And so we need to either have a very good way of accounting for that 
or not. We desperately need to get more data from around the Dorset and Devon coast and the Somerset coastline. And we really could do with more offshore data. It's fantastic to have the ORC data in there. Um, the, I think the offshore data can, uh, can really, because we might have, say, a bad year of sightings around the coast, but it doesn't necessarily mean common dolphins are doing badly in the southwest waters because they might just all be feeding much further offshore and we're not seeing them. Um, but equally, it might do. It might mean, you know, there might be poor sightings across the whole area. But unless we have all that data, it's really, or more data, it's really hard to, to really understand what's going on. Um, we could do with working out a good methodology to account for effort in some way doesn't necessarily mean effort needs to be recorded with the data. There might be other ways that we can try and account for it, but we need to maybe come up with a good methodology and then think about putting it through a form of peer review so that so that we've got this consistent something we can we can use because it again it helps to it helps to validate our data if we can do that. And then finally, one of the whole points of Southwest Marine Ecosystems is to consider uh, all the different elements of what's going on in Southwest marine ecosystems. So investigating the possibility of analyzing variances in cetacean observations in relation to the other areas of the report. So when our state, you know, what's been going on with the plankton over the last couple of years, because that's the base of the food chain, what's been going on with the oceanographic conditions, what's been going on with, with um, human impact and so on, and see if we can see any correlations, any, any fluctuations, because after all, that's the whole point of trying to put it all together. So these are goals for the future if you like um anyway thanks for listening um and happy to answer questions and hopefully i didn't go on too long and put anyone to sleep about half an hour perfect thank you very much duncan um if anybody has any questions do pop them in the chat and um, we've got some interesting discussion going on in there as well um one from keith uh is relating to the image of the rissos dolphin um he is, let me just find it again, uh, wondering if the round marks and scars amongst the rake marks, are they likely to be caused by octopus? Uh, yes, probably. Um, and that's the other thing. So in other parts of the UK, octopus is listed as their primary prey. Um, and interestingly, we had that bumpy year for octopus this year. Um, we don't know if we don't see them feeding on octopus just because we don't see evidence of it in the same way that we see evidence of the cuttlefish. Because when we see the cuttles, what they seem to do is um, the mant they, they bite the tentacles and the head off and the mantle floats up and then the blackback gulls will come down and peck it. Um, octopus might not behave in the same way when it's eaten. So yes, yeah, to answer that question. Thank you. Um, and we've got another question from AJ, um, who says, as the data generation for these species are only done by eye observation, then are the data we're getting correct? No, <laughs> here's the short answer. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not useful. The data is not useful. Um, so we just have to understand that and account for that. The the more robust the data is, the easier it is to work with, and the more you can do with it. The less robust it is, the harder it is to work with, the longer it takes, and the less you can draw from it. It's one of the reasons I was trying to validate it by looking at it compared to the scans data. Um, so I'm looking at ways we can try and validate our data to give it more credibility, if you like. Thank you. Um... Right, if there's no more questions, do keep popping them in the chat as, as you um, think of any, and we can always ask them at the end. Um, we will move on to the next presentation now. So we have um, Abby Crosby, Marine Conservation Officer for Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and Dan Jarvis, Director of Welfare and Conservation for British Divers Marine Life Rescue, who will be talking about the 2022 cetacean strandings from a partnership perspective. Okay, brilliant, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen can everyone see that normally on your screen is that all fine helen yeah all good yeah fab i had a real issue the other night with zoom 
sharing my very average notes. So that's not ideal. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Duncan, for that brilliant introduction. Um, really interesting stuff to see it all pulled together into one place. And uh, thank you to Helen, the University of Exeter, for hosting this evening. Um, so, yes, I'm Abby. I'm one of the Marine Conservation Officers at Common Wildlife Trust, and I support and run the Marine Strandings Network. Um, but I'm joined tonight by Dan Jarvis, who is Director of Welfare and Conservation and Area Coordinator uh, for Cornwall and the Isles of City for British Divers Marine Life Rescue. So Dan's talking twice this night, this evening, bless him. And um, But we'll both be summarising some of the key figures of stranding. So all the dead cetaceans which wash up around our coastline from 2022. And Dan is very kindly including a couple of cases that BDMLA managed for the purpose of tonight's webinar. And I really appreciate that there's quite a significant proportion of people that don't know anything about MSN on this uh, webinar. So just to give a very brief introduction, um, we've been running for 30 years. 20 of that has been within the management of Cornwall Wildlife Trust, which we are celebrating this year. So happy birthday us. Uh, and we gather data on all organic material that washes up around our coastline. So obviously that includes everything from fish, sharks, turtles, jellyfish, and mollusks, but we do have a focus on cetaceans and actually other marine mammals and um, seals. So the project for the last 20 years has been managed by Cornwall Wildlife Trust, but our data coll um, collation and processing is supported by the Environmental Record Centre for Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, which we host here at our office. But our entire function is via volunteers. It's really an example of gold standard citizen science. We have a 24 hour hotline, which is that hotline there that you can report all Cornish strandings to, which is coordinated by a team of volunteers. And we have over 200 volunteers that are trained to go out to site and record a stranding event. So when that happens in this county, carcasses, let's focus on cetacean carcasses, are assessed. They're assessed in situ on the beach by those trained volunteers, but very suitable carcasses, ones that are incredibly fresh, will be taken for post-mortem. So as we always say, this is like our strap line in all press and PR, from a really sad event comes an incredibly value, op a valuable opportunity to observe these otherwise very elusive creatures you know, observe their biology and their ecology in a non-native, non-invasive, relatively cheap method. And we can gather all that information, which can be used to understand them and be used in their conservation management. So it is incredibly useful stuff. Um, alongside the recording, the practical, you know, uh, assessment, we have other outputs throughout the year. We have an annual a report that's released, um, an annual conference, which actually is taking place this Saturday, the 11th of March. We have annual training days for our volunteers, social media, and of course, the data that we collect is used in research and the creation of uh, papers. And of course, we also influence, we use all this information to influence policy, both locally and nationally. And uh, yeah, that Strandings Forum that I mentioned is this Saturday, and there are still online tickets available uh, until tomorrow afternoon 3 p.m and uh, if you want you know this is a snapshot on strandings that's a whole day dedicated to it and BDM La will be there also presenting so if you're really interested in this stuff I recommend you getting an online ticket and Helen is going to kindly put the link in the chat for me this slide is just to give you an insight on, of how we sit on a national scale so this work isn't just for Cornwall this is for you know the whole of the UK so now on that slide, you can see the Natural History Museum mentioned. So actually it was the Natural History Museum that um, collated the records of all stranded cetaceans in the UK since 1913, so a very long time. And then it was back in the 90s, it was 1990, that Natural History Museum began working in collaboration with the Institute of Zoology to research cetacean populations around the UK under DEFRA, under the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. That project now today is known as the UK Cetacean Strandings Investigation Programme or CSIP, and that is still under the management of the Institute of Zoology. And we, and you can see our, our logo there, are, now, are an official partner in CSIP, just like the Natural History Museum 
is um and we contribute sometimes up to my dog is growling at something which is quite disconcerting when you're alone in the in a dark office anyway um we uh we contribute often at least 20 percent of uk of data to the uk strandings uh, sometimes 30 percent so you can see our county level work is absolutely vital um and of course at the bottom there of the slide you know in cornwall we have a fantastic network of very close partnership with uh, organizations such as British Divers Marine Life Rescue, the Sill Research Trust and the University of Exeter. Okay, this slide is all strandings. Okay, because I mentioned we, we record all, all dead organic matter that comes into the coast. Um, from 2003, when the trust took over management to the present or to 2022, um, and you can see the variety of species or groups, should I say, that we record from sharks to whales. You can see that 2022 continues to be quite a significant year for some species. Seal strandings have really increased over the past 10 years, perhaps due to awareness of reporting. This is something that CSIP are going to be working on nationally, actually, um, because seals are historically underreported nationally and they're going to be doing some PR this year. So you may see that to encourage people to report seals around the UK, not just cetaceans. Um, you can also see there an, a significant number of seabirds. So that's that uh, orange color at the bottom, the brick orange color. Uh, that, that was associated with the avian flu pandemic that we're still experiencing, but we experienced it in quite a significant uh, level in particularly the autumn when the gannets had their post-breeding dispersal period, which meant they left their breeding sites, you know, heading out into the Atlantic and sadly dying en route right on our doorstep. So we, we experienced a lot of dead stranded seabirds uh, around our coast in 2022 um, but focusing back on cetaceans the reason we're here tonight uh 2022 was you know relative to the last uh several years slightly quieter with 151 carcasses stranded and that compares to 207 in 2021 the highest being 255 in 2003. I will flag now that these figures that I'm presenting tonight will differ from the fig figures that are published in our 2022 annual report later this year as we're still processing and cleaning the data. But I just did a data dump and pulled out what I could for this evening to, to kind of have a quick look at what was going on last year. Um, the reasons why 2022 is slightly lower is unknown. We always, of course, compare it to the live sightings because as naturally a high population uh, will result in greater strandings and vice versa. Sometimes when we have um, events in strandings, let's say a high stranding event, we may compare it to other activities like fishing activities. Um, uh, which I will talk about on another slide is why we do that. Uh, an example of that is earlier this year in January 2023, we had a huge number of uh, cetacean strand along a specific area of the south coast of Cornwall. And, you know, it's in those moments that we can look at what activity was going on in the area around that very particular time. Um, but still, 151 animals in one year is really significant. Um, it's what we see washing up around our coast is probably the tip of the iceberg about what will actually be out at sea. So it's not a number to be blasé about. Now, this map is actually a map from 2021. As I said, I just did a quick data dump for 2022 for this, um, and we haven't mapped our 2022 data yet. It, but it's still important for you to see that, you know, it will be very similar for 2022. We get strandings all around our coastline, but we often do get a high frequency of strandings along the south coast of the county. And this table just, um, graph, sorry, shows us the species that we've come in and actually 2022 was a really amazing year for diversity we had the atlantic white-sided dolphin which got quite a lot of press at the time which was an amazing beast which stranded along the coast near portreath on the north coast uh, we had three rizzo's dolphins um a bottlenose dolphin the pilot well there's two striped dolphins so you know it was a really interesting year for strandings um as you can see there we also have the high number Number of common dolphins which are the you know most popular species to strand that wasn't always the case you know 20 years ago and this is very anecdotal um 
from I need to kind of get the figures out but we used to get a lot more porpoises strand in some years more porpoises than common dolphins and there's definitely been a shift in species over the past few decades um now this is table again now we're back to 2021 so that was 2022 species now we're back to 2021 and that table is the post-mortem results for 2021 because I don't have that for 2022 yet um so all of this, the citations which strand, which in 2021 was 207, wasn't it? Something like that. Around 30 individuals will be suitable and able to go to post-mortem under the Cornwall Marine Pathology team and our pathologist, our brilliant pathologist, James Barnett. So these have to be animals that are really, really fresh. You know, they've literally just died. If they're, very, they're a rare species, or a rarer, should I say, species, then James may examine them in a slightly more decomposed state. But ultimately, they're really fresh. It's quite an, an exclusive activity, ultimately, what I want to flag here. And every year we look at the cause of death. And that's that's that table there for 2021. So in 2021, we had 28 animals go to post-mortem. And of those 28 animals, the cause of death for 10 of them, which is 36%, was bycatch, which is accidental entanglement in fishing gear. Bycatch was in 2021 and continues to be one of the top causes of deaths in cetaceans, particularly common dolphins in southwest waters. Um, we haven't got the 2022 data processed yet, but you are undoubtedly going to see similar statistics. And it's the reason that the trust continues to campaign for the mitigation of bycatch. It continues to look um, research solutions uh, in partnership with the fishing industry. We sit on regional and national bycatch working groups, and we will just have to continue advocating for the need to effectively tackle bycatch with our UK government, with policymakers, until we start to see these statistics reduce. We've been banging on about this for a long, long time. And we are not seeing those figures changing. Um, so it's really not good enough. Um, but as I mentioned before, postmortems are quite exclusive. You know, out of two over 200 animals, only 30 of them will go for, for, for postmortem. So to kind of to look at that, what about the rest of those animals that have washed up the beach? We're, we're losing valuable data there. So in response to that, the trust developed the Bycatch Evidence Evaluation Protocol, or BEEP. And that gives us the ability to assess all those other carcasses which strand for external features of bycatch. Those photos there are part of our beep sheet. So they're, they're all the sort of uh, signature external features. So that allows us to increase our bycatch evidence portfolio. So it's really, really important stuff. Um, that little table there is the 2021 figures again, that shows that alongside those 28 animals that went to post-mortem, 114 more were suitable for beep assessment on the beach. And of those, a hundred of those 114, another 17.5% have probable or definite signs of bycatch. So a really important addition to the evidence base. But of course, in addition to bycatch, there's a lot of reasons why animals strand. You know, it's not the only reason and, and die around our coastline, but you'll have to find out more about that if you come to our forum on Saturday. Um, but to talk a little bit more about other animals which were examined via postmortem, I'm now going to pass over to Dan from Biedmalar. So Biedmalar and MSN work really closely together all the time. Many of our volunteers are part of both organisations and all the animals which are attended by Biedmalar injured or in distress around our coastline and then sadly die then come into the marine strandings network for examination so i really appreciate dan being part of the talk tonight to highlight some of the cases from 2022 and i'm going to click through for you dan so you just shout when you need me to click um Abby, uh, i feel like i might be doing a um COVID presentation because I'm going to keep saying next slide, please. Yeah, <laughs> it will. Um, Dan, your, your audio is not good. Dan, if you can hit okay. your, your audio is not good. Uh, so, live strandings in 2022. Uh, 
Oh, okay. I'll turn off my video. Is that better? That sounds a bit better. Yeah. If you could just talk a bit closer to your microphone, that might help a little bit. Okay, then. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, uh, live strandings in 2022 that were reported to BDMLR, we had seven um, incidents uh, reported across the southwest of England. The highlight the handle of the force on uh, Dan, I think you're having some internet troubles maybe. Stranded, uh, and died and they were only found after they had died. Hang on a moment, I'm just gonna try. Yeah, I think it's connection issues as well as your microphone's a bit weak. You're really disjointed and breaking up. So I think your internet's obviously just being impacted by something maybe in the background. think is Dan um, just sorting out Danny just sorting out your audio he's still in he's still in uh, I just want yeah if, bear with us folks I wonder if he'd left the meeting and come back in again maybe but no if he's still here it might be that he you know somebody in the household's live streaming something or oh. you with us Dan it'll be good actually it's more important that Dan gets his audio sorted for his humpback talk because I think we're all really looking forward to that <laughs> so um, it's still pretty disjointed Dan Oh okay. Um, well, my, my first slide is self-explanatory. Um, and then there, there's just uh, three, uh, three or four slides with uh, pictures of strandings uh, that we dealt with. So uh, Abby, if you, if you want to carry on, just ca carry on and look through those photos uh, there. We've just got a striped dolphin from the Isles of Scilly uh, from April. And then the following day, another striped dolphin from near Lizard Point. Uh, and both of these animals unfortunately didn't survive, but were in very poor nutritional condition. Uh, the first one died and the second one was euthanized. Uh, we also had a Sowerby's beaked whale in South Devon, uh, which died very quickly. Uh, and unfortunately was also an animal in very poor nutritional condition. Um, and uh, James carried out a post-mortem examination on this one, uh, which uh, had some interesting findings, including a hook, fishing hook through its tongue. Uh, and the final stranding to mention is a common dolphin near Plymouth in Millbrook, uh, which again was in very poor condition. Uh, didn't actually strand during the day, but uh, was found there the next morning and presumably had stranded. Brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Um, that was that was great. Um, we, as I said, at the Strandings Forum, we'll be, there'll be, uh, you know, uh, lots of presentations about the research that's gone on for the last 20 years, the, the finds, the conservation finds from that research. And um, BDMLA will be having a talk, um, Dan will be talking at that about their work over the last um, two decades as well. So um, if I think Helen has put the link in the chat, which is fantastic. So if anyone wants to join us online, there are still tickets available online. We're fully booked in person um, and the tickets have closed for in person, but there is uh, online tickets available. We also recently, uh, if you want to know more a bit 
about Marine Strandings Network. We recently did a podcast for Cornwall Wildlife Trust, due to it being the 20 year anniversary. So um, you can listen to our world podcast and that link is going in the chat as well. Um, otherwise, do download and read our online reports and follow our organisations and projects on social media because we all have um, those active accounts. And, uh, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Abby. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat, but I think we'll go to a break now and then allow Dan to sort um, see if he can sort out his internet and then we'll pop back. Um, so we'll have a quick break for about five, five or so minutes. Um, so we'll see you back here at about five past seven, if that's all right. Fantastic. Okay, we'll just wait another minute or so for um, anyone to come back from toilet and tea breaks. Um, Dan's going to have another go at giving his talk. Um, he's hopefully sorted his internet out now. So yeah, sorry again about that, but we are actually ahead of time. So we'll we'll give Dan another chance at doing that. And shout me when you're back on. Hi, Helen. Is is this any better? Yeah, I can hear you now. I can see there's two of you. Are you on your phone? <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd try and cover both bases. Yes. Um, let's see how this goes. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. Well, um, yeah, we'll let Dan have another go at his talk then. Um, so yeah, whenever you're ready, Dan, you go ahead. Okay, uh, Abby, are you okay to share the presentation again? Sorry. Yes, hang on one moment. Let me just, um, for some reason. <laughs> yep. Do, 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 do. Here we go, Dan. Okay, I'll just get up to the first slides. Okay. Oh, okay then. Um, hopefully this is better now. Yeah, it sounds better. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Let's hope it holds out. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there were seven uh, live stranding incidents reported to or attended by BDMLR in 2022. Um, but we have to also uh, take into account that isn't the total sum of live strandings last year as that there were most certainly other animals that did live strand but were only found after they died um, and it's only three post-mortem examinations that there was confirmation that, that they they had actually live stranded um, so we've just picked out a handful of cases to have a quick look at here so next slide please abby uh, this is the first of two striped dolphins that live stranded this one was on the Isles of Scilly on the 28th of April. Uh, this animal was in quite poor nutritional condition. Uh, it did briefly refloat on the tide, uh, but restranded and died quite quickly after that. Uh, this was then followed the next day by another striped dolphin. Uh, there were both males as well, adult males. Uh, this one stranded in a really difficult location down on the lizard at Kerfilian Cove. Uh, and again, this was an animal in poor nutritional condition um, and was euthanized in this case due to that 
uh, both animals were successfully retrieved for post-mortem examination uh, and uh, by, by um, Marine Standards Network volunteers and Cornwall Marine Pathology team who did a really amazing job, especially with the, uh, the Isles of Scilly one, that was no mean feat at all. Um, both animals were obviously confirmed to be in poor nutritional condition, i.e. they hadn't fed in a considerable period of time. Um, they both had uh, parasite burdens, heavy parasite burdens uh, as well. Um, so uh, these are animals that, uh, that appear to have been on sort of a downward slide in terms of health for, for some period of time, probably over a course of several weeks. Uh, the next animal to have a look at, next slide please, Abby. This was a Salby's beaked whale that uh, live stranded or, or got stuck in the shallows at least uh, near Torquay uh, in South Devon. Uh, this animal, again, uh, you might be able to see in the left photo, you can visibly see its spine. It was an extremely poor nutritional condition and died relatively quickly as well. Uh, this animal was also retrieved for a post-mortem examination uh, with James Barnett as well. Uh, the animal had uh, a beak that was broken in several places, likely as a consequence of live stranding and getting stuck in amongst rocks uh, as well. Uh, but also quite interestingly, uh, this animal had what appeared to be a, uh, a line uh, a mark in its dorsal fin that was caused by a fishing line and this is potentially corroborated by when the animal died and was being examined by DDMLR volunteers, a fishing hook was found embedded in its tongue uh, as well. So this is an animal that is a deep diving species, it is not normally close to the coast like this. So this was probably an animal that was already de uh, debilitated uh, way outside of its normal habitat and hadn't fed for again a long period of time had come close in shore and it seems potentially got caught in an angler's line just prior to dying. The last one to mention here is a common dolphin that was in the Tamar estuary uh, at Millbrook on the Cornwall side in December. Uh, it was an animal that was in again poor nutritional condition and most of the day it was monitored by BDMLR volunteers as it um, sort of circled and drifted in on the tide through the afternoon. Uh, it did come into the shallows but didn't properly live strand and it soon moved off again a little bit further out where we couldn't really get to it um, and as it got dark we had to leave uh, and then the next morning it was found dead so uh, unfortunately that one appears to have uh, live stranded during the night and died where it was but uh, given that it was in poor nutritional condition in any way the outcome had we gotten to it would have been euthanasia in this case as well uh, so again another animal that was uh, just generally in a really poor state of health uh, that's it for me i think abby um uh, you got any more to add that might be it no that's everything now dan thank you great thank you very much dan and thanks again to abby um we've got a couple of questions um one has come through, uh, it says, thank you for all the great work that you do truly. Um, I wondered how amenable to conservation efforts the fishing communities are. Um, actually, you know, I've worked with uh, fisheries about 10 years ago on pinger trials and you know, the people that, uh, the, the people I worked with were, in, they were supportive. And I think when it comes to cetaceans, they very much do not want to catch these animals in their nets, um, they do care very much about them, but also it's also, you know, it damages their nets and it's expensive as well. So for every reason, they're keen to find solutions. Um, and recently I did a post about a baby common dolphin. Actually, that would have been 2022 that stranded in St. Agnes on Trevornet's Cove. It was tiny, you know, I could pick it up with one hand. It was about 60 centimetres long. It was really small. And um, it had died of bycatch. Bi and I did some social media about it. And I'm part of the St. Agnes Marine Conservation Group. And the local fishing association got in touch to, to, you know, to look at things that they could do to stop that happening um, under that, you know, in their control. So, you know, really positive steps. And I think that's the great thing about our organizations and, and particularly, you know, the wildlife justice that we're really about working with people and with industries and finding solutions together. Because I actually think that's a really, really effective way of 
doing things so we can make the change on the ground but you know we also you do need a bit of a stick as well as i said there is a massive problem with bycatch it's not changed in 20 years um so you know we also need to maybe push things forward a little bit quicker uh, with the ideas that we have and the solutions that we have found. So I'd say that that's probably my answer. Great, thank you. Um, and kind of following on from that, um, are there any particular nets or fisheries in operation in the Southwest that pose a greater threat to cetacean species? Yeah, I think I saw someone reply to that. So the, the, the net that we really look at are gill nets because bottom and um, porpoises bottom feed, um, particularly like sand eels, they are really prone to getting caught up in those bottom set gill nets. So they have like a lighter top line and a lead slightly heavier bottom line. So they sit perpendicular in the water and uh, the porpoises get caught up in them. Um, so that is a real problem. Back, you know, 20, 20 years ago, it was bass pear trawling that did tons of damage to particularly common dolphins. And that's why um, there was a bass pear trawling ban brought in in inshore waters um then you know but we do see other types of fishing that you've got to keep an eye on we saw ring netting you know which is an msc uh, fishery we saw them ring netting with with cetaceans in the middle of their nets a few years ago there's some quite damning uh, images that were, were were shared from that so you know i think you know, all, the all industries need review um it's krill krill pots that catch whales up in scotland leatherback turtles in our waters are always caught up in our pot lines so you know all, all types of fishing ha have implications and um, but particularly gill nets are what you know impact our kind of common species in cornwall great thank you um i think we're kind of up to time now so we'll uh move on to the next talk um, so we're joined today by Laura and Stu, who um, run Operation Cetacean, um, which was co-founded by Laura and Stu in 2017 um, and is a project which focuses on the harbour porpoises and other cetaceans found in Tor Bay. So over to you. Hi, guys. Thank you for having us. And uh, it's great to share the platform with so many amazing speakers as well. So. Just to give a quick overview of ourselves, we'll just introduce ourselves so you know who we are. We're sort of the outsiders from Devon, and hopefully we can connect a bit more with our, our peers and colleagues in Cornwall as we progress as well. So hi guys, uh, Laura here. So my name is Laura Roberts, and I'm director and co-founder of Conservation Check UK. But I'm also co-founder and lead researcher at Operation Cetacean. Um, we're not an organization, we're not a charity, we're literally just a project um, that's run off our own backs really out of passion and concern. Um, I've got a degree in animal conservation science, so conservation, animal conservation, wildlife conservation, and marine conservation specifically is my passion and what I'm qualified in. Uh, I've got every year's experience in the animal science sector, and in my, uh, my day job, I just kind of teach students how to look after animals. So my entire life is kind of circles around animals and wildlife and nature. And just a little bit about me, you can just see some stuff on the screen there. But above all them things, I would just say, like Laura, I love being in nature and just a nature geek. And I suppose the essence of Operation Cetacean is we didn't feel like much was being done in our local area. So we just did it ourselves. And I, I hope, uh, you know, if there's any conservation concerns in anyone's areas or there's lots of debate about fishing and why aren't people doing this I just suggest everyone if you can just spare a bit of time there's lots of things you can do free to just get involved in conservation but Operation Cetacean itself began in 2017 so what we started to do we just uh, Laura started a research project it was an undergraduate project and she just wanted to know all about the porpoise in her local area and especially how marine vessels were having an impact on it then after that uh, mini dissertation Laura did, we started to grow as a project and we found it as a project in 2019. And again, we're not a business, we're not a charity, it's just a group of passionate people that get together. And our team keeps growing and growing and growing. And we wanna just learn as much about the harbour porpoise, especially in the Tor Bay area and the threats that they face. So it sort of stems as well from us seeing jet skis and so on. Uh, not all of them, but a lot of them are harassing the cetaceans there. But as we're growing, we're 
sort of expanding our project and we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we'll do or plan to do as well. So after my uh, mini dissertation, so it was my undergraduate project, um, I've spent over 40 hours stood on Berry Head in Brixham, uh, monitoring uh, harbour porpoise behaviour and presence in relation to marine vessel uh, frequency and type. And I kind of got a bit obsessed, <laughs> is the best word really. Um, so all I, I just got totally fixated on this because I started to notice some interesting things, which we'll talk to you in a, shortly about. Um, but I want to know, what do they do all day? Where do they go? Why is Berry Head so special? Why are they attracted to that area? What are they eating down there? Um, are they impacted negatively by human influences? And my research has kind of unearthed the answer to that a little bit. Um, what influences their behaviour? And I want to know, are they truly resident to the area? So what we know so far from uh, our research project, obviously at the moment we're only looking at focusing on surface behaviours, but we do have some projects to sort of tie in with some of the acoustic stuff which was mentioned before. But we know that they spend over 80% of their time actually feeding, and this is backed up by quite a lot of research within their range as well. We also established that as marine frequencies increase, fewer porpoise are recording and also feeding behaviour reduces. We often see the porpoise just fleeing the area. As of yet, we don't know where to go and we don't know uh, at what expense that interruption is actually causing. Also, the porpoises are using the waters below Berry Head every month of the year. So we've seen sightings in every month uh, and also we see mothers and calves have been recorded as well. So again, it's just part of our work trying to establish whether these animals are actually truly resident in their area. And why is that important for the porpoise? Well, we know at current, uh, within the, where, we surf, where we watch these animals, I should mention, is just into the Torbay Marine Conservation Zone. And at the moment, we know mobile species are not part of the protection within the conservation zone. So stuff like in our area, we have some great seals and uh, great research taking place with the seals there, but we also have these harbour porpoise. And at the moment, there's no extra protection. So we want to learn as much as possible. So just our information and our data can really feed in to the science which already exists. And we know that these animals are living on sort of that energetic knife edge and any disturbance could be having an impact on their fitness and their survival as well. So we know uh, from our own research, but also lots of peer reviewed research that human interference and disturbances can cause behavior changes that are detrimental to their well-being and cause acute and chronic stress as well. So we've seen the behavioral impacts, but there's lots of papers uh, which sort of suggest these animals are becoming distressed and um, also injured because of human activity. And this is that living on an energetic knife edge. So there's an author called Leopold, and in 2015, he sort of poised that frame with Arbor Porpoise, that because they're so small, because their blubber layer is actually quite uh, thin compared to many cetaceans, these animals really do need to feed and feed and feed throughout the day, with full-grown porpoises needing to feed around five kilos of food per day. Now, where we're actually based, you can probably imagine we're just off Brixham, which is one of the biggest fishing ports. And, you know, these animals are competing with the fish that humans are actually going after. So that's something we want to start looking at as well in terms of the diet of these animals and what they're actually eating off Berry Head. Uh, there's a local ornithologist which has been looking at birds off Berry Head for over 40 years. And we got speaking to him a couple of years ago and he noted for the first time on some of the cliffs that there were no fulmers there. And he sort of put it down to the sand deal population sort of declining. So we're quite pleased at the moment within the last few days, the government sort of uh, mentioned a little bit more about protecting the sand deal fisheries, which of course harbour porpoise eat, but so the countless seabirds. So that's uh, something that probably everyone could try and feed into the consultation of that. That would really help these animals and all the seabirds attached to it as well. 
And another thing we really wanted to do, and this is difficult, but sometimes we come up with these mad ideas and then we're like, come on, we'll pursue it, even though it's very, very difficult. We know uh, dolphins, it's quite simple and, and quite widely used in terms of fin identification. There have been a few studies on harbour porpoise, but harbour porpoise, the fins are a bit more discreet. They're much smaller. The animals are shyer. So if you're out or more shy, so if you're out on a boat, they're going to disappear. But we have started to catalogue some of the things with fins. We're in quite a unique position in Berry Ed, where there's a low quarry area where you can actually get quite close to the animals from land without, dis without disturbing them, which is really key. So we started lots of collection with this. Uh, some of the software we, we were using was clumsy. So we're just trying different software now, making sure everything's correct with this. As you can imagine, you want the fin picture about the size of your computer screen. Then we can use this software. And this just ties into our other research that we know they're breeding here. We know we've seen mothers with calves. We know we've seen them every month of the year. Now we want to try and see if actually the same individuals are actually using this area. And again, it's by far no, by no means easy, but it's a little challenge that we've set ourselves. It might be a disaster, but we're willing to try if it can feed into the conservation of the species. We also think, again, we, we never ask for money and so on, but if we can put names to these animals, we're hoping one thing is that we can get the local community on board with them. And sort of one of the uh, ideas we have is, Brixham's a very proud fishing community, so we want to sort of name some of these animals after some of the trawlers in Brixham, just to try and put a bit of spotlight on these amazing animals. And our main focus as well has been the vessel disturbance. And we must admit that actually the fishing industry is actually causing least disturbance than when we've been observing because their boats go straight out to the fishing ground. They've seen a million porpoise dolphins before, so they're certainly not chasing them and harassing them which we see with uh, many of the jet skis and higher boats, and unfortunately some of the wildlife tours as well. So we've got a couple here. We have managed to do some of the fins as well. Uh, we're still going through the trial phase. It's not an exact science with this at the moment, but we thought it would just be a blessing to name the first ones after our parents. So we've got David, which is Laura's dad, and uh, my mum as well, Christine. Uh, and again, it's just, I know we shouldn't, but it's sort of attaching a bit more emotions to animals and trying to get people to recognise individuals and look for individuals and learn to love these amazing animals, like we do with the dolphin population. So we mentioned before about Prince and Harry in the chat, uh, Harry and Wills in the chat before. So the range of harbour porpoise is just shown on the screen there, and you can see just by looking at the map, the UK is quite a stronghold for these animals. So they're found all around our coast. They are our smallest cetacean and they are our most commonly cited cetacean. But we know, and, and some of the data in some of the public, uh, sorry, some of the presentations before sort of show that that might be changing as common dolphins seem to be increasing a little bit around our coast. And you can just see there around the UK, we're based roughly where my mouse is there. So we do see these animals in our area lots and lots, which is fantastic. Although many people, again, when we're on the cliff uh, tops, we're not just collecting our data, we are actually speaking to lots of people as well. One of the main things we get is, oh, look at them dolphins, and we're trying to explain that actually they're a different species, but it just ties into that love. If we can have a five minute conversation and just get someone on board or share something new, that's amazing. And we also learn lots from locals as well. But this is just the IUCN. Um, sort of conservation concern of harbour porpoise. So they're considered least concern, which is great, but the color, current population trend is unknown, which always could be worrying. But there's also been some more research, and I've done a, a bit of research with this in fish, uh, and it would be great to sort of do it with uh, some marine mammals as well. But we've been looking at the toxins in fish from plastics and so on. And recently on the news, you've probably heard of new diseases named after plastics in seabirds. But because of some of the toxics, not just from plastics in the ocean, there have been some studies that are suggesting that the testicides in harbour porpoise are actually shrinking, which inevitably is going to make them less fertile. So I guess from a conservation point of view, it doesn't matter how many individuals there are, 
if indeed they might actually become less fertile. So again, we've just got to keep an eye on populations numbers. And I guess that's why lots of the work what the colleagues tonight have been doing is really important because that population trend is significant. And even though we might see these animals daily, we still know very little about them. So we're just going to go through what's next. Some of our amazing volunteers there. So again, we have uh, people from lots of universities helping us, graduates, dissertation students. And honestly, we learn so much because we have marine uh, toxicologists working in our team. We have people who are experts with GIS and stuff like that. Some of the stuff weren't available when I was at university. So it's great that we can learn off these guys as well. But just a few things that we want to do next, we're going to begin collecting sound data of porpoise and boats as well. So again, we want to look if there's any noise impacts because we obviously we've been monitoring them surface behaviours, but we've got a decent hydrophone which we can use. And also we're working with a responsible tour operator as well who's collecting hydrophone data as well. So it just adds into that. Also as well, what we want to do is analyse public perceptions of the wider Torbay Marine Conservation Zone. So many of locals and many of my students in the area don't know it's a protected zone. And I just think of protected zones sort of across the world. They use them as a key marketing tool rather than a potential problem. So we want to know, first of all, do stakeholders know about it? All stakeholders, is it a problem? Are some of the issues raised initially by the fishing industry actually warranted or has it not been a problem and so on? We want to collect more footage of porpoise behaviours as well. Uh, we're going to continue monitoring porpoise behaviour, marine vessel behaviour, and also link that in with the environmental influences as well, because we think there is something unique happening off Berry Ed. Many of the studies we've looked at suggest you better to see, or it's better to see harbour porpoise on high tide. At Berry Ed, we generally see them on low tide and just after low tide. We also want to raise awareness about how to behave around marine mammals as well. So it's speaking with them stakeholders. We want to come to um, that win-win situation. Uh, I noticed Bob Hills in the audience. I remember I was at Coastal Futures a few years ago, just before the pandemic. And there was a great talk there just about stakeholder engagement and about producing a win-win um, situation for conservation with stakeholders. And that's really something we took away from that conference and really embraced with this as well. We also want to share our research with schools, uh, colleges and universities as well. And also, might be pie in the sky, but we're determined to give it a good shot anyway. We want to develop a dorsal fin ID catalogue from porpoise within our area and then maybe further afield as well. Also, uh, we've sort of done a little bit of work with a local lab. Uh, it is expensive, and we were just getting other people's data, but we've used environmental DNA in the area, uh, and this has allowed us to look at some of the fish in the area and also to perhaps help us identify some of the prey of these animals, which is fantastic. Uh, we were using a fish primer in there, but a fin whale was still found on it, which was fantastic. And it just shows how different types of research can work together because we were like, well, is it a fin whale? Uh, as just the piece of DNA drifted in the ocean, was it in the local area, et cetera, et cetera. But there was actually a record on the Sea Watch Foundation's website uh, at a similar time reporting a fin whale uh, just a couple of miles from where we actually had the device collecting eDNA or, or where the local lab had the device, I should say, is more accurate. Uh, just some of the outputs as well. We want to get our message out in as many different means as uh, media types as possible. Excuse me, I'm losing my words, but I hope you can understand. Uh, we had a publication in the Ocean and Coastal Journal, which was fantastic. It was great. We made sure Berry Ed was in the title there, Brixham. So we're really focusing on our local population. It's been an honour to talk at so many different conferences as well. Uh, we actually run a Southwest Marine Fest conference, which is taking place on May 31st in Painting. Shameful plug, I know, but I'd be stupid not to mention it. Uh, also, we've had outputs in probably less scientific uh, mediums, so such as BBC Radio Devon, YouTube. We're not quite there yet, but hopefully we'll get on TikTok to meet as many different audiences as possible. And I noticed Sarah and James, uh, uh, James Thomas and uh, Sarah from the SEAL Project are in the chat. We've done some work with them in the local area, uh, extending Operation Seabird, 
which is sort of the police and marine management organization working together to raise awareness about behavior around um, cetaceans. They probably wanted Operation Cetacean, but I think we nipped that one first. And also the Paynton Zoo are keen to raise awareness of the Marine Conservation Zone as well, and doing lots of great collaborative work there. And they hosted a coastal community event at Paynton Zoo the other week. So it was really an honor to get involved with that. And of course tonight as well. So thank you very much for the insight. Uh, this is just an emerging picture. I've not put too much data in tonight because basically because we're all volunteers, keeping on top of the data can be difficult. And I suppose on reflection, one thing we could do, even though we're sort of obsessed with our local area, one thing we probably could do more of is collaborate further afield and feed into some of the amazing data sets we've seen tonight. But just an emerging picture in Torbay, pretty much every time we would go to the headland, we would stand on the headland and within a couple of hours, we would see a harbour porpoise. Pretty much guaranteed, you could almost set your watch on it if the tide was right. What we've seen recently, especially within the last year, we've probably got an equal chance, if not more of a chance of seeing common dolphins. And that seems to be at the expense of the harbour porpoise sightings. So we know there's records of other dolphins, especially bottlenose, uh, having an impact and attacking harbour porpoise. But we just sort of, again, it's just something we've noticed. Uh, we've got no statistics to back it up. We've got no data to back it up. But it's something we're keeping an eye on and something we'll probably start looking at in more of a formal way, just looking at um, the interaction between these two species and also the sightings within the area to see if there is a change in the populations in our area. I think that made sense. Uh, but that's it from us, guys. But please feel free to follow us on social media, Operation Cetacean. Uh, we're not experts in this area, so we just read a lot. We attend a lot of conferences and so forth. And we're always willing to work with people. We're willing to put the graft in as well. Uh, if anyone has any questions, though, guys, please uh, fire them away. And if they're difficult ones, I'll put Laura back on. Thank you very much, both of you, and you're very welcome. Um, yeah, one thing that we've uh, definitely noticed the last couple of years is, uh, especially for the cetacean data, it's been very Cornwall focused. So um, yeah, it'd be great to get some more data from Devon and further afield. Um, so we've got a couple of questions for you. Um, Michael Poulston, sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name right, um, has said, Stuart, is there any evidence that paddleboarders and kayakers are causing disturbance to cetaceans given these activities have now greatly increased in popularity? Yeah, uh, hi Mike and uh, thank you for the amazing work you do with the shores of South Devon as well. Um, off Ferry Ed, it's quite a distance out from the harbour so we do get some hardcore kayakers going off Ferry Ed and we do get some hardcore paddleboarders going off but it's probably not the most sensible area to go on your paddleboard. But with our data, we thought it would be vessel type causing the disturbance. So we assumed the louder boats, the faster boats would, but we just sort of any vessel, when there's porpoise there and a vessel comes through, including kayaks, the porpoise just scatter. So data is little because uh, paddleboards especially don't tend to go off very yet. But with kayaks, we've just noticed as well, when, when kayakers are there and the porpoise are there, the kayaks scarper anyway. Sorry, the porpoise scarper anyway. Great, thank you. Um, and just um, a question from myself, actually. Um, could you expand a bit on the process of the eDNA um, collection and research? I don't actually know that much about it. Yeah, so there's a local lab and I've put you in contact with them. And essentially they've been developing the, the technology. So they put a device at the bottom of the ocean and this device has little capture chambers. And on a time period, it takes a sample of the seawater. So eDNA is just environmental DNA. So if there's any DNA within the environment, feces, for example, from some species that are skin tissue, et cetera, et cetera, then that will come into this collection tube, which they just gather every now and then again, almost in like a big vat. And that's taken to the lab. And then a bit like, um, I guess we did with normal, like PCR studies and stuff with DNA, they just use different primers to see if any of the DNA matches. So for this study, they used a fish primer, 
because they were primarily looking at fish, but it still does pick up other uh, DNA, such as the mammalian, mammalian DNA of the fin whale there. But it is really expensive. It gets cheaper the more you do of it. But it's something I can certainly put you in contact with a guy and, and it's something we want to build up on. But again, it, it's coming out of our own pocket at the moment. And that's the way we like it. We don't like to ask for money, but we're thinking about doing some fundraising to try and get that data as well and maybe run it with some student project. Great, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, any more questions, do pop them in the chat um, and we can ask um, at the end. Uh, but we'll move on to our final talk now. Um, so we're gonna welcome back Dan Jarvis. Um, and he is going to speak to us about the humpbacks that we've been seeing. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'm really hoping my audio is still okay. It sounds better now, yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's give it a try and see what happens then. Um, okay, can you see that? Whoops. Can you see that? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. Uh, well, um, uh, yeah, I'm back again. Um, so this is uh, the, well, I guess it's the, the proper introduction now of the Southwest UK um, Humpback Whale Photo Identification Catalogue. Um, never imagined three years ago that we would ever have one, but seeing as we've had so many uh, sightings, as Duncan alluded to in his talk earlier, um, we, we now can. Um, we did mention briefly some of these at the conference last year and in the webinar last year, but things have changed uh, quite dramatically since then. Uh, last year we had six animals in the catalogue, um, thanks to the um, powers of social media and being able to search out photos on there, we've jumped up to 16 animals that have been identified in southwest England. Uh, going back over the last sort of uh, 10, uh, 10 plus years, 10 to 14 years or so. Uh, before I do get into any of this, uh, there's a lot of people to thank in amongst uh, all of this for various bits of data, especially photos. That's the really key bit, of course, in an ID catalogue. So in particular, uh, Lindsay McNeil, uh, who runs the Scottish uh, Humpback ID Facebook group, um, she's certainly been leading a lot of efforts uh, in the country, making links with other organisations and collecting data from uh, much further afield than I've been able to. Um, and we've been feeding our sightings in uh, to, to her and sharing sightings. So uh, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, as well as that, the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, uh, Orca Island, of course, Cornwall Wildlife Trust, uh, sequestered servers such as uh, Terry and Charlotte, Ian, Brenda and Adrian, uh, and, and many others. There's a lot of you out there. I'm sorry if I miss anybody out, but, but absolutely thank you to all of you. Uh, various observers in the Isles of Scilly. Again, we heard Duncan mention that a lot of the sightings are actually coming from uh, Scilly. Uh, and there are people over there such as Martin Goody, uh, Joe Pender, Samaya Reid, um, Robin Mora, and others who are reporting sightings uh, and getting photos of these animals that we can use. And then, of course, boat trip operators such as Marine Discovery Penzance, uh, Padstow Sea Safaris, AK Wildlife Cruises, uh, Mermaid Pleasure Cruises, New QC Safaris and more. And then there's the international catalogue as well, Happy Whale, uh, which is ultimately where all the photos should end up in the big international catalogue. And uh, I'm working on getting a lot of the photos that you're going to see in this presentation this evening across into there at some point uh, and hopefully when we come back to this next year, we'll have some more international connections. But without further ado, uh, our first and probably most well-known whale is Pi. Um, you'll see along the top that all of these whales, or some of these whales at least, uh, will have a Southwest UK uh, SWAC code, uh, and he is number one, or she is number one, uh, and various other names. So uh, Pi, gets his or her name from the mathematical symbol that you can see in the lower right photo. Uh, and hopefully that's pretty obvious just under the dorsal fin, also known as cream tea in this area too. But you can see the codes from the other catalogues uh, as well that this whale is known from uh, as well. Um, so 
as we go through this uh, and with Bob's encouragement last year after the presentation, we have started naming our own whales. Uh, so they are better, to, um, uh, more easy to know uh, than just with some random numbers and letters. So this is Pai. Uh, Pai, as I say, he is our most, uh, he or she, sorry, is our most well-known whale, having, having originally been seen uh, in Mounts Bay, south of Lamorna in uh, uh, the August of 2019. Um, this animal has also been recorded on uh, a few occasions in Southwest Ireland as well, but has also been a repeat visitor to the Southwest as well. Um, so it's the, the only animal so far that's showing consistent annual site fidelity to Southwest England. So uh, around Christmas of 2020, Pi returned to the Isles of Scilly and persisted there for uh, a few weeks, up as long as February of 2021. Um, then disappeared, uh, didn't return the next winter, but in August of 2022, uh, so last year, getting on to the, the most relevant data, the 2022 stuff, uh, Pi was actually recorded at the Isle of Lewis uh, last summer. Uh, up in Scotland uh, and remain there uh, again for a good couple of weeks at least uh, before returning to the southwest and in the beginning of December uh, Pi was photo identified again back at the Isles of Scilly and is potentially still over there or may have very recently left the Isles of Scilly so uh, Pi has been around all winter over at the Isles of Scilly as best as we can tell so uh, that's probably our most uh, exciting animal in terms of site fidelity. But we also have exciting animals that go further afield. And here we've got Helen Chadwick, uh, uh, host this evening um, and uh, convener of the cetacean, uh, a group of editors uh, for the webinar as well. So uh, Helen uh, here was uh, first actually identified uh, in 2021, but it was from a photo taken in 2008 at the Isles of Scilly. That's the top right photo. We have got tail fluke photos of Helen as well. Uh, so uh, the Isles of Scilly in 2008, um, it was also identified south of uh, Franz Josef Land, which is uh, a group of islands north of Russia in the Arctic Circle. Uh, so that was in 2012. So uh, a four year gap where this whale hadn't been seen, uh, but linking Southwest England to uh, the Arctic. Very excitingly, in April last year, we have the photo taken uh, on your screen in the lower left. Uh, this photo was actually taken uh, and submitted to Happy Whale by Alex Brenner. And this was taken off the Silver Bank in the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean. And that is a known breeding ground for humpback whales. So over the course of the last 14 years, this individual has been seen three times, but in those three times has seemingly linked an entire migration route between the Caribbean to the Arctic with a stop off in the Isles of Scilly. So it'll be really exciting to get more sightings of Helen. We've also got Abby Crosby, uh, who we've also met previously tonight, but this is the whale version of Abby. Um, so Abby um, was seen on a number of occasions in the winter of 2020 uh, and 2021, uh, mostly in the west of, uh, south, far southwest of Cornwall, from uh, sort of the edge of Mounts Bay around by La Morna, all the way around to St. Ives Bay uh, between November of 2020 uh, and early January of 2021 and we had several sightings and quite a few good photos taken by Sequest volunteers, uh, a selection of which you can see here. Uh, we haven't seen Abby since but again this is one of the animals that I'm, I'm really keen that it, you know it could be quite an exciting one if we do see Abby again um, uh, and, and wherever else she might turn up in the world or he might turn up in the world because a lot of these animals, pretty much all of these animals, we don't know whether they're male or female. Uh, so, uh, yeah, playing it a little bit risky with naming them um, here. We also have uh, uh, Kevin Metcalf, named after my partner. That was a little bit of a Christmas present. Uh, 
didn't want to name one for myself, so I thought it might be good uh, to name one for him. Uh, but uh, Kevin, you might remember, uh, was the animal that was in Plymouth Sound in the summer of 2021, uh, around the time of the Sale GP uh, race that was going on. And this was actually a, a poorly looking animal, uh, unfortunately, and it persisted in the area for four days. So it spent a lot of time in around Plymouth Sound. Uh, and then on the third day, moved around into Cornwall, into Whitsand Bay, and was seen again the following morning, uh, traveling past Blue Island, uh, about as far as Polpero, and then completely disappeared. Um, this animal until about a month ago, I really didn't have any good photos of for identification. Uh, I managed to find a couple of photos, uh, one of which you can see on the right hand side of your screen taken by James that was uh, through, through an internet search. And uh, just in those few days when I was doing a lot of the social media research looking for historical photos of humpbacks in the southwest, completely out of the blue, a chap called Toke Mal uh, just emailed me. Um, uh, you know, never, never been in contact with this chap before, or lives abroad, um, and he had been in a kayak uh, when this whale had passed him by near Lou Island, and he got some amazing underwater footage uh, and photos from above the surface of this animal uh, as it swam past him uh, on his kayak. So, you know, the timing was just ridiculously coincidental, uh, but we now do have some decent photo ID images of, of, uh, of Kevin. Um, it would be lovely to know if Kevin is still around. So again, this is an animal we'd really want to find out from uh, ID catalogues, the international ID catalogues like Happy Whale, uh, if they were ever seen elsewhere, and particularly after these sightings in 2021, uh, to know whether this animal survived. Uh, we have this animal here, number five. Um, this is an Irish, uh, the one named already by the uh, Irish catalogue as Big Ben. Uh, so uh, we decided to stick with that rather than come up with even more names for them. Uh, this one uh, has been seen uh, just once uh, in southwest England, um, and that was uh, between the Isles of Scilly and Land's End in 2021, in the summer of 2021. But there have been a number of sightings of it in Ireland since 2020, uh, running right the way through up until after the sighting in uh, July of 2021 at the Isles of Scilly. Uh, it was seen in the following weeks in County Kerry and County Clare on the west coast of Ireland uh, as well. So uh, again, another one that would be really exciting to find out if there's uh, been any new sightings uh, of it. And I should say that uh, we're, we're, we are making contact with uh, IWDG in Orca Island and hopefully getting access to more or less sightings data as we don't have complete sets from them yet. So uh, we're aware that they have been recorded in those catalogues, but we don't have all of the sighting uh, dates and locations for them yet. So that there's probably a few more that we don't know about with this animal that we could add to our list once we were able to share data. Uh, our next animal named by uh, Duncan here tonight, uh, named Morville, which is Cornish for whale, which is, I think that's a really lovely name. Uh, so we're moving away from naming them after people, um, and we have a bit of a second naming theme going on now with some of the uh, more recent whales uh, using Cornish uh, words. So Morville here uh, has been seen again uh, since 2016 uh, along the south and uh, west coasts of Ireland. Uh, this animal was seen in the summer of 2021, uh, first at the Isles of Scilly, and then a few weeks later in Mounts Bay as well. And since then, in 2022, and early, uh, um, sorry, in uh, uh, 2022, has been seen back in Ireland again. Um, and uh, spoiler alert for next year's webinar and Southwest Marine Ecosystems report, this animal has actually been seen in the Cape Verde Islands just a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is really, really exciting. So again, making more international connections. The other really interesting thing about Moorville is, and you can see it in the top left photo, uh, that long straight white scar going from the uh, centre of the flukes out onto its uh, left hand fluke. Uh, that scar was not there a year ago, uh, or a couple of years ago, sorry, I should say. Uh, it appeared sometime over the winter 
of 2021 and into 2022. So it looks very much like an entanglement injury that's healed over. But whether Morville managed to free him or herself uh, or had to be helped somewhere else um, in foreign waters, we don't know. Uh, but obviously an animal that's lucky to survive. Uh, then we've got Bob, uh, named after uh, erstwhile leader uh, uh, of Southwest Marine Ecosystems. Uh, Bob um, has been seen once, but is a new addition to the catalogue in 2022. Um, it was reported by uh, and photographed by Tim Mackey, who submitted these photos to Happy Whale, and it is a new animal in the catalogue. So we only have one sighting of Bob so far, but hopefully Bob will turn up again uh, in the future. Wherever in the world would be lovely to know, but if it's back here in the Southwest, even better. Then we have uh, Snowy, another new addition. Uh, this is a spoiler alert for 2023 because this animal hasn't uh, been seen previously in 2022 or prior to that, but uh, this is an animal that's been keeping pie company over this winter at the Isles of Scilly. Um, and this is an animal, hopefully, again, we might find some more international connections for once we do a little bit more sharing uh, of the, some of the photos. Then we've got number nine here, uh, Senan, uh, Cornish for the place name Senan. Um, this animal has been seen uh, a few times. Uh, and again, it's over the course of this winter, uh, up until very, very recently, uh, mainly around the Land's End area and St. Ives. So uh, once again, a spoiler alert for next year's uh, conference. Um, but, uh, but this animal is one that I've been lucky enough to see uh, three times, uh, you know, and again, that's something five years ago and never thought I would ever be telling anyone that I've seen humpback whales three times or even the same humpback whale three times uh, in a fortnight. It really does give perhaps a bit of perspective about how much things have changed with humpbacks just in the last few years. Uh, around the same time, we have this whale, um, loosely in association uh, with Senan. Uh, this one was actually first seen down at Nanjizzle, where there's the well-known um, arch uh, that, uh, that people love to go to swim in. Uh, and that arch is called Zorn Pig. And that's where this animal's name comes from here. Um, this one uh, has only been identified around Land's End. Um, we suspect it did come around into St. Ives Bay, but we never got any photos to ID it from. But there was certainly a second whale around when Senan was there. Uh, but this animal was uh, just uh, three days ago, it was re-identified again from a new sighting down at Lamorna. Uh, so this animal is potentially around at the moment. So if anyone's going out sea watching at the weekend, please do keep an eye out and get good photos because we'll be able to find out if that's this same animal is hanging around. Uh, it would be lovely to get some photos of its other side, as these are the only ones that we've got uh, of just this one side. So if you see humpbacks, try and get pictures of both sides. That would be a really good bit of advice. And uh, next animal here, number 11. Uh, we're going historical now. Uh, these aren't recent animals. These are the ones that we have found from old records. Uh, this one particularly from Bibi Malar, in fact. This was the whale uh, that was off South Devon. Uh, in 2017 and became entangled twice in uh, fishing gear uh, and was rescued on both occasions as well. So there were several sightings scattered between February uh, and April uh, of that year, uh, latterly when it was getting entangled, unfortunately. Um, but we did manage to find uh, through internet searches some really good ID photos of this animal. Uh, and again, these are photos which, if we can get them into uh, the Happy Whale catalogue, we might find has been identified in other parts of the world or other parts of the UK, uh, for instance. So uh, potentially another exciting animal for us to uh, get, a, get some more information about. Uh, then we, uh, we do have a couple of unnamed animals still that we're, we're working on getting names on now. But again, this is uh, a couple of historical photos that we found from a sighting in 2016 in St. Ives Bay. Just the one sighting. Um, the photography of Brian managed to get some relatively decent shots of the animal. So if it does turn up again, you know, we've got a chance of IDing it again if we, if we can get these, uh, these particular shots, angles on the animal. And the same goes again for this one here, uh, again in St. Ives Bay, but this time in 2019, 
uh, that we literally just have this one photo, but it's, you know, the, there are some features on there that would be identifiable again if we can get the right kinds of shots and angles of this animal if it's ever seen anywhere again. Uh, we have this animal, which, uh, which is quite sad, obviously, you can see it's deceased. It's the only animal in this catalogue that we know a gender for as well. It's a male, uh, and it is also, unfortunately, the only animal in the catalogue that we know for certain is deceased as well. Uh, this was an animal that we dealt with at BDMLR back in 2010. Um, it was a, a maternally dependent calf that was sadly separated from its mum and had taken up uh, residence underneath the Cardinal Boy at the Stones Reef behind the Dreevy Island in St Ives Bay. Uh, and it stayed there for about a week. Uh, and we were monitoring it. We were, uh, you know, ask, asking around, um, you know, boat operators, uh, RNAS Coldrose with their helicopters and planes, you know, just anyone that was out and about on the water to see if there was any sign whatsoever of this whale's mum as clearly without its mum being a dependent calf, it was not going to survive. There were never, unfortunately, ever any sightings of an adult whale in the area at the time. And the animal did uh, eventually, well, it disappeared in fact, and then it turned up uh, dead uh, uh, about three weeks later, I believe it was. Uh, so not a happy outcome for that animal, but still we have photos documented of this animal and it's now recorded in our catalog as, as, as an animal that existed. And we called it the Dreevy after the place where uh, it was last known to live. We have this animal here then, uh, another one dealt with by ourselves at BDMLR. Uh, this was a uh, juvenile humpback whale uh, that was down near Zena, west of St Ives in the summer of 2011. Uh, and unfortunately you might be able to make out in the top photo that it is entangled. Um, we did have a go at trying to disentangle this animal, but we were unable to that evening and we had to leave when it got dark. Um, sadly, we never had any more sightings of this whale. Uh, so we don't know if it survived, if it got free. Um, and these are the only decent-ish photos that we've got of it. It'd be a really hard one to ID again, but you can see in the lower photo, it does have two uh, rope marks going over its back, which will have scarred. So, you know, there is a vague chance that we might get to ID this animal again in the future. Um, and again, it would be lovely to know if it survived this, um, this entanglement here. Uh, our final animal in here was seen by uh, Captain Keith Leaves and AK Wildlife Cruises in uh, Falmouth Bay. Uh, that was in spring of 2017. Uh, and it was briefly uh, as you can see in these wonderful photos taken from, um, uh, still, sorry, stills taken from uh, video of the animal. And again, from these stills, there's enough detail uh, on the animal, uh, particularly around the head, where we can get some ID features. Uh, hopefully recognised if this animal is spotted elsewhere in the world, elsewhere in the UK once again. So that is everything we have so far on humpback whales in southwest England. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing and uh, show my face briefly. Hopefully the audio has held out through that talk. I apologize if it has been a bit scratchy. Um, but yeah, but you know, this is very much a citizen science project. Um, you know, there's been lots of contributors from the boat operators, from independent observers who I've hunted down on social media. Uh, and have posted their photos uh, to uh, you know regular observers, especially at the Isles of Scilly, uh, and key people such as Lindsay and IWDG and others who uh, who have much more advanced catalogues than we do, um, who have been a real huge help in in enabling us to outreach and make connections with some of our whales, uh, such as Pi up in the Isle of Lewis earlier this year, and uh, Moorville down in Cape Verde recently as well. We wouldn't know that if it wasn't for people like Lindsay. So uh, yeah, um, I suppose the news is to watch this space for next year to see if we've got any new additions, new sightings. Um, and with the new sightings, where are they going? What are they doing? And I think probably the next step for this project is to try and get a better handle on uh, sort of size estimates, uh, you, you know, the relative age, uh, whether they're adults or juveniles for these animals, because most of them we don't really know that well. Uh, but if we can start getting a bit more of that information, 
you know, will really help us develop our catalog, but also get us to develop what we know about the individual animals themselves beyond sightings. Um, but of course, this kind of information is really important for us now as an area that seemingly is becoming uh, a bit of a humpback hotspot now over the last few years. Um, is that going to develop? Uh, you know, are we going to see even more humpbacks coming back? Are we going to see pie returning every year or most years? Uh, you know, these, these, these are some really big questions which we're just going to have to wait and find out the answers for. So it's all really quite exciting on the humpback front, but uh, hopefully that's just giving you a, a really basic run through of who's who in the humpback whale catalogue for Southwest England. And an appeal as well before I finish, if anyone out there does have humpback photos, and you've seen the quality of some of the ones here tonight in the catalogue. If you've got any humpback whale photos, please, please, please do send them in so we can add them to the catalogue. It might just be one photo that you've got out of a sequence and we might just be able to identify that one and be able to tell you who it is or add it as a new one to this catalogue. So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, hopefully, I, oh yeah, I've just run under time, in fact. So there's time for questions, I guess, Helen. Thank you very much, Dan. Yeah, lots of people echoing um, in the chat how exciting it is to have them um, back in our waters. Um, and I have to say it was the best Christmas present to be uh, suggested as a name for a humpback whale. And Dan and Duncan were very modest and said, no, no, we don't, don't want to be named humpback whales. And me and Abby were like, no, sod that. We definitely want to be named humpback whales. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, one question that has been coming through is why do you think we've been seeing so many more humpbacks? Is it due to climate change or what's behind it? Yeah, good question. Um, for, from talking with other people, uh, you know, who are, who are more knowledgeable, I have to say, on this sort of thing than I am, um, it, it, it's more likely to be a recovery of the population since the days of whaling and they were wiped out in some parts of the world, including around parts of Europe, sadly. Um, but since the moratorium back in the 80s on uh, whaling and humpbacks have become far less targeted around the world, the population is recovering and it's a good news story for conservation. Uh, you know, they are recovering and in doing so are either returning to old habitats that they used to use or are coming to new habitats that they haven't previously used. Whether there's a, um, uh, an implication of climate change in that is hard to say, but as we've seen in Duncan's talk, the environment out there is changing. We're getting more and more common dolphins shifting north. Um, you know, and it, it, is it that that pattern is also happening with humpbacks? Is it that they've spent more time in the Bay of Biscay rather than here and they're shifting north? But we do know from other areas of the UK, so the south and west coasts of Ireland over the last 10, 15 years, that they've been through this exact same thing and they're now getting humpbacks in numbers every year. Um, and parts of Scotland are as well, the west coast of Scotland, the, the Firth of Forth, again, just in the last few years are really taking off as humpback hotspots as well. So it does really seem that the UK um, and even parts of the North Sea, as we've had sightings off the Netherlands, um, most years in the last few years as well, um, are becoming potentially important new habitats for humpback whales. And if we delve into the sightings that we have here in the southwest, a lot of our humpbacks are turning up around the Isles of Scilly, but especially along the south and eastern coasts of St. Mary's, up as far as the Eastern Isles. So there is potentially a you know, a suggestion from their consistent use of that particular area that that might be one of the most important habitats for them, specific habitats for them in the southwest of England. And if that trend does continue in the future, uh, you, you know, then, then obviously that can lead on to, you know, potential conservation measures for them if that's a habitat that needs better protection uh, or around Land's End, which is where we tend to get a lot of the sightings as well around towards St Ives Bay. Uh, you know, these important humpback habitats that we need to have some better protection of. Uh, so those are some things to go away and think about, really. There's little data to go on at the moment, but it's encouraging so far. And the more we get, the better we'll know more about them and what we can do to help them. Great, thank you. Um, 
one's just come in from Charlotte. I think, Abby, you're probably best place to answer this. Um, with increased sightings, have stranded humpbacks become more common? No. <laughs> I think that's the simplest answer. No. No. We've always, you know, oh gosh, I need to pull the strandings data, but off the top of my head, we have the odd one, don't we, that's a bit poorly or strands. We had the one off um, Lou Island that floated offshore and got bigger and bigger with gas and then disappeared. Was that not? That was two years ago, probably, Dan, wasn't it? That was 2021. Yeah. That's 2021. So my, my gut feels to say no. I bet we've had like the odd one. I don't think there's any trend, but I would obviously have to look more closely at the data. Cool. Um, Dan, a question for you from Hannah. Um, do you remember the one that was cut free by heroic action from by Chris Lowe? Um, was that one catalogued? Uh, yeah, that one was catalogued. That's the, uh, I'm just going to look back at the number now. Uh, that was, uh, that was actually named by Chris and Annabelle as well just the other day. So that's number 11 in our catalogue, Dupold Trek, which is Blackpool Sands in Cornish, uh, which might be controversial given this animal was in Devon. I apologise. Um, thank you. And a question for um, any of our speakers, I guess, um, from Emily. Uh, it says, is it known why John Cohen Aquarius visited Cornish waters back in 2021? And do you think we'll start to have an increase in orca sightings? We well, Brenda, Brenda, she um, saw, saw one the other day. And uh, Brenda's a superb sea watcher. And I trust her sightings implicitly. And uh, we have a record in orcs for... When was that? Oh, you can't unmute yourself, probably. It wasn't that long ago, though, was it? A week or two no, ago, a few weeks ago. I think it was April 2021, I think. No. I think. No, Brenda saw one no. the other day. You saw one the other day? Oh, the other day. Sorry, I thought you meant yeah. John Coe. But... No, no, not John Coe. No, no, no. no. Coe. I don't know if it's them. But, Dan, you could feel probably best to answer something like that. Uh, well, yeah, with John Coe and Aquarius, they, uh, they are what remains of the West Coast orca community from Scotland, um, which unfortunately seemed to have broken up since the death of one of their females, Lulu, uh, I think it was back in 2016 or 17. Um, and Junko and Aquarius are both males, and they have been traveling around mostly the west coast of Scotland as a pair, but perhaps in the last two or three years have potentially been ranging further and further. Certainly there have been sightings down the west coast of Ireland. Um, uh, I think they were seen once off the coast of Anglesey as well. Um, and then a couple of years ago, uh, they did come down to Cornwall and were seen photographed off Porth Curnow. What was really interesting about that one sighting, we, we, we literally did just have that one sighting. It's the first ever sighting of them in England. Um, and if I remember correctly, I think it was about two or three weeks later, uh, they were back off the Isle of Mull in Scotland again hadn't been seen anywhere in between, so we don't know whether they went up through um, the Irish Sea or around Ireland through the Atlantic uh, to get up to there. Uh, but then it was again sort of two, three weeks after that sighting in Mull, they were seen in Dover in southeast England. And again, a place they have never visited before, but they basically circumnavigated the entire UK in just over a month, I think it was. It was pretty incredible. And then they've been back in Scotland and I think they were in Ireland again last year, last summer. So they haven't been back down here. Um, it's not to say they would never come again, but it's really interesting what's going on with that group since they've broken up. You know, the, the behaviour has become uh, really um, something of great interest and great importance that we track what happens to these remaining two as we don't know where the others went. They're, they've completely disappeared, the, the other survivors, and we don't know what's gone on in that group. Um, so that again, the more sightings, the more information we can collect about them, the more we can understand what might be going on with them. I yeah. guess we, we could make a comment here about, I mean, the question also is about just in general, will we see more orcas, wasn't it, I think? And we have to remember that orca are, you know, are in a bit of a bad state because of their pollutant burdens. But they are massively impacted by PCBs. Um, which is really affecting their survival rate, um, their viability, 
and so when particularly in the inshore population so when when we look at these you know different there are different groups that will be impacted differently but ultimately it's it, gosh the, the situation with orca is is a different kettle of fish compared to other cetacean species um so yeah it's a bit more of a complex picture i think with them Great, thank you very much. Um, well, if we don't have any more questions, I think we'll wrap up there. Um, I will pop our um, Exeter Marine email in the chat. Um, so if anybody does have any more questions for the speakers that you think of afterwards, um, ping me an email and I can pass them on. Um, but thank you again to all of our wonderful speakers. Um, and yeah, don't forget if you want to join the Southwest Marine Ecosystems Conference, um, I popped the uh, link in the chat earlier and the Marine Strandings Forum as well. Um, so there's still tickets available for those, um, online tickets only for the um, Strandings Forum. But thank you very much um, to everyone for joining. Once again, this has been recorded. So if you've missed any of it or um, needed to drop out at all, um, you can catch up uh, once it's uploaded onto the uh, Southwest Marine Ecosystems YouTube channel. Um, and yet, if you go right to the top of the chat, um, I did put the full program of um, Southwest Marine Ecosystems webinars in there as well. Um, so there's loads of other topics in there, all from water quality, MPAs, fisheries, um, everything you uh, could want or need. Um, so thank you again to all speakers and all attendees. And um, yeah, have a good evening. Thank you.